Okay. So, uh, as I was saying, we are about a third of the way through. Um, we are still, um, we've done our existing conditions analysis. Um, we're looking at the, the needs for the mobility network, and we've had two rounds of public outreach. So we're, we've collected some information, but uh, we're still uh, waiting for some information from all of you and starting to put together what those recommendations for the plan would look like. Next slide, please. Um, with the goal of completing everything um, in, in the summer. So the main outcomes that we are uh, on track to deliver is a multimodal mobility plan, and that essentially is looking at, rather than just an active transportation plan and uh, a transit plan and having these sort of disparate pieces really to pull them together to see how all types of travelers uh, access the citywide network, um, the parking management plan started a little bit um, at the very beginning of the study, so we're a little bit further along with that. And then updating the streets plan, looking at prioritized improvements, uh, but also looking at the Green Streets Network, um, transit improvements, uh, design guidelines, and also uh, looking at your existing policies. Next, please. Uh, thanks. So, as I mentioned, we've had two rounds of outreach. The first was in spring of 2016. Next slide. Um, we had uh, an interactive map online in addition to uh, going out into the community and hearing from people directly and received hundreds of comments. Uh, this is just an example of the types of uh, the sort of the different uh, types of comments that we received so that people can see that we did collect comments from people who are walkers, bikers, drivers, transitors, et cetera. Um, next, please. And here are some of the um, bits of feedback that we got from people uh, walking and creating a, a walk-friendly environment or prioritizing a walk-friendly environment was certainly among the uh, top uh, bits of feedback. And then in addition to that, uh, making sure that uh, parking is managed in a way that creates um, or supports local businesses, uh, visitors in a safe and convenient manner. And then uh, reliable connections to transit is something that also rose to the top. But um, as you can see, there's a, a great cross section of different types of comments that we received and we'll be looking at all of them. The other thing that I should say is this is just the, the top um, tier of comments, but we did have a, a long list and all of those comments uh, will figure into the plan or, and be addressed in some way. Next, please. So in the second round, we asked people to tell us about the priorities uh, for improvement and shared some of the findings from our um, first round of analysis and our existing conditions. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, we had about seven different meetings uh, across the city and then also an online survey. And uh, again, we asked people to tell us about some of the strategies that we could envision um, employing in the city here. And again, you can see that there is a, a good cross section based on people getting around the city, not just by uh, biking or walking or what, what have you, but also strategies for improving driving, uh, parking, uh, transit. Um, and you can see a, a good cross section of feedback here, um, looking at uh, low stress neighborhoods and bike routes was certainly something that rose to the top, but. Uh, again, there's a good cross-section of other types of improvements, and I'll describe those a little bit more uh, in detail. Next, please. In addition, we've been talking with uh, different stakeholders throughout the city uh, and, and uh, with also HTD and other agency staff to make sure that we're getting uh, good feedback from different groups and taking a deeper dive on some of the issues that we have heard about uh, and also testing some of those strategies. Next, please. Thank you. So as we look at uh, some of the existing conditions, uh, some of this, um, this part at least may be a little bit repetitive for some of you, but we just wanna make sure everyone starts off with a good grounding and some of the information that we have. Um, we looked at commute flows in the city, trying to understand who, is, and is getting around the city and how they're getting around the city. Um, one of the things that was surprising to people is that um, Fayetteville, as it's growing, is actually creating more jobs. And what that means is that people are able to stay in Fayetteville for work. So 50% of workers in Fayetteville are actually staying. That means only half are leaving. But that also means that the improvements that we 
um, recommend need to address the local as well as the regional uh, network. Next, please. Um, looking at walking in Fayetteville, um, we here are showing a combination of the comments that we received in the top right hand corner and the density of those comments and, and concerns that people have shared with us about walking uh, in Fayetteville. And then on the bottom left is an example of uh, some of the safety analysis that we've done. About 20% of traffic collisions occurred um, within 15 minute walk of a school, library, or recreation center. And one of the ways that we're focusing our analysis is to look at um, different points of interest around the city and how to make sure that the network is connected and safer in those areas as we move forward. Next, please. Uh, when we look at biking in Fayetteville, uh, again on the right, we're seeing uh, where comments were filed for uh, biking uh, questions or concerns around the city. Um, and then some of the analysis that we've done on the left where we're showing that um, bicycling is a small percentage of trips, but in fact, many of the commute trips in Fayetteville are less than three miles. Three miles is an incredibly uh, bikeable distance. That's a distance that you can bike for most people in under half an hour. And so one of the things that we're looking at is uh, completing the active transportation network and finding ways to improve, again, safety and, and connectivity. Uh, it's also a concern that has been raised with uh, many of the folks that we talked to during outreach. Next, please. Um, when we look at transit in Fayetteville, um, one thing, of course, is making sure that we're coordinating with the existing transit providers um, through uh, Razorback and um, with RT, and then also looking at ways that we can improve access to transit, uh, whether it's by improving the walking connections, because every transit trip starts with a walking trip, um, or looking at ways that we can improve the transit hubs and access to the transit hubs, whether it's um, park and ride facilities and what have you. But um, one of the things that we've noticed is that 50% of transit stops are within only a few blocks of the Razorback Greenway, which offers opportunities perhaps to connect people to transit by biking to some of the transit hubs or transit stops. Next, please. Uh, driving in Fayetteville is something that, of course, uh, everyone experiences or most people experience as well. And so we're looking at um, where the drive uh, concerns have been registered on the right and then also looking at the existing conditions on the network. Um, congestion in Fayetteville is very highly peaked, meaning that there really aren't that many areas that have experience congestion during the off-peak, but during peak periods, there are some specific locations and specific corridors where we do see a heavy congestion. Um, congestion and road maintenance are top concerns for people, as well as uh, figuring out ways to improve east-west connections uh, in the network. Next, please. And then when we look at uh, parking in Fayetteville, um, as I mentioned, the parking management study is a little further along, but we've tried to understand what is the existing supply of parking. And here, we wanted to understand what the parking and the occupancy or utilization of those spaces are, particularly in the downtown and entertainment district. And a lot of times when we look at parking, a lot of people focus on what's localized in the area. Um, and we're seeing a good number of spaces if we take a step back and see how many of those spaces are available um, with a little bit further walking distance. And this is one of the concerns that we heard from the public is trying to figure out ways to, to make those connections between parking facilities that may be a little bit further away. Um, when we look at this though, we also have to keep in mind that there are concerns at specific locations or in specific times of day, uh, like the WAC, um, for example, where we know that there can be parking crunches at particular times of day or during events and, and uh, that sort of thing. Next, please. So when we talk about parking management, um, we do want to focus a little bit more on some of the strategies and, and we've had a fair number of stakeholder meetings and discussions with people to understand what are the concerns um, in parking and trying to deliver some of the strategies uh, and management uh, strategies specifically. Uh, the city has been working to advance uh, some strategies, both on their own as well as through uh, some recommendations, 
but these are some of the recommendations that we would love to hear some feedback about. So one is to begin to streamline the permit program and looking at the parking price and demand and balancing that system, trying to understand where there is existing parking and how can we make sure that if the, there's existing off-street parking versus on-street parking, are those prices um, uh, balanced, but also making sure that the amount of permits that are, um, that are uh, released matches the amount of spaces that makes sense and making sure that it's easily accessible to people so they know uh, where and how to get their permits, where they can use those permits and that sort of thing, um, whether it's on the back end as well as on the, the front end so that there's signage available. Looking at multimodal improvements, as I mentioned, making sure that if people do choose to walk a little bit, to park a little bit further away, which means that they may have a longer walk to their final destination, whether it's one minute or five minutes, what can we do to improve those uh, those experiences of walking from one location to the next? Whether it's through improving the, the streetscape environment, whether it's through lighting, uh, even making sure that there's a, an actual direct connection to different locations, which should be relatively um, well accomplished in the downtown, but that's uh, something that we, again, want to make sure people understand and, and have good access to. Um, looking at a residential parking uh, benefit district and figuring out ways to reinvest parking revenues in local areas to improve uh, facades or uh, sidewalks um, and enhance the, the streetscape. Um, and again, increasing the publicly accessible parking supply. Um, a lot of times it's difficult to understand whether a private lot is, uh, is publicly accessible, making sure that those fees are balanced in some way um, is another possibility. And then also figuring out ways to share access to those lots uh, wherever possible, um, working with private uh, property owners to develop agreements to make sure uh, when they're amenable to that idea to open their parking lots to more users so that we can adopt more of a park once strategy when people go to the downtown. Um, and then uh, going along with that, making sure that there's a, a streamlined signage program and wayfinding program so that people understand um, what's available and, and when and how much it costs and, and that sort of thing. Next, please. Um, one of the, the ideas here and sort of the overriding um, theory is to, to begin treating parking as a customer service and figuring out ways to make sure that people understand what's available in terms of parking before they even arrive at their destination. So figuring out ways to, to make information available through an app or through online um, and figuring out you know, what's the, the ways to make sure that that information is available in real time and you know, finding ways to carry that through from when they leave their home all the way to the arrival at their destination, whether it's through payment, again, or information, and then throughout their stay uh, through an automated system uh, that people can access, again, online or uh, through their phones. Um, other options include demand responsive pricing so that we are balancing the amount that's available looking, again, through the system and directing people to locations where more spaces might be available um, again, through uh, apps or online information, or simply adjusting the pricing at the, the meter um, or at the uh, pay point. And then improving uh, event parking management, which is uh, pretty critical uh, in this area in finding ways to include um, valet services if uh, that's appropriate, depending on the type of event, uh, whether it's a front door parking space or uh, walking a little bit uh, further away or having a valet available and uh, making sure that people know how to uh, request their vehicles or what have you in advance. So looking, oh, yep, perfect. Um, so the other thing that we're focused on, as I mentioned, is the street typologies and looking at an update for the streets plan. So we started with the existing master streets plan, which has different street classifications uh, based on the, the function of a street as well as uh, some recognition of where it sits in the network. Next, please. 
Uh, we also looked at the existing plan characteristics, and I think this might be animated, so press twice. Oh, one more. Um, so looking at the, the different typologies that are there, there are many different types and subtypes. Are there many different details to track? And then the next one, please. Um, and looking at the different specifications that might need to be negotiated and trying to analyze both the content of that information as well as streamline the way that that information is understood by people who are living or developing uh, new properties in the area. Next, please. So we looked at a, a couple of different um, case studies in the area that most closely aligned to uh, Fayetteville's typology, both in terms of the size of the city and the types of issues that uh, Fayetteville is trying to address. Uh, Ann Arbor is a good example of a college town that's a, a similar size and, and issues and looking at the way that they use their network to incorporate both the priorities for the different ways that people get around, the different modes of travel, as well as the context uh, that we're looking at and the different uh, land uses that, uh, that abut the, the streets and, and adjacent to the different typologies. Next, please. And then we also looked at Morristown, um, which is a more citywide approach. And you can see a little bit more how they have looked at the different typologies and tried to consider um, how this cross section of a street and the function of a street changes as the street progresses through the city and goes again through different land uses and different uh, densities. Um, they cre created uh, type specific uh, recommendations and also prioritize the pedestrian realm. Next, please. And then the final thing in Columbus is building in some guidance on requirements versus flexibility and trying to be clear about the way that that uh, moves forward. And so uh, this is another example of tr trying to figure out what is what are requirements for different types of streets, what are the different elements that are incorporated and uh, how might they change from recommendations to uh, opportunities and really stitch together a little bit more flexibility in the typologies rather than creating a whole new typology. Next, please. Uh, I think you have to click one more time. Uh, I think one more. So here is an example from Boston and how they try to really clarify the cross section of a street. This focuses on a sidewalk zone and obviously for uh, Fayetteville, we want to do the whole uh, right of way, but uh, they we are updating them based on proposed typologies uh, for the city, and then also looking at how they sum together to make sure that we understand what is the, the complete right of way for a street. But they're looking at the ways that uh, different components or elements of each zone uh, stitch together to create a complete uh, sidewalk in this case, or a complete street in, in a more um, broad, base. Next, please. So here um, we are proposing to go from, I believe it's uh, nine or ten different typologies down to six. And the idea here is that we start with a recognition that there's a sort of urban center or a high activity street where there's a dense uh, mixed use core um, uh, accommodates the highest pedestrian activity and incorporates different types of modes. And that would more align with what a more local um, road looks like. And then we have two different types of regional links. And these are essentially arterials, and we're separating them out a little bit because we recognize that some arterials might go through land uses or might have different types of activities along them. And so we might have to treat them a little bit differently. But the idea is that these are the streets that are function as more uh, regional connectors and serve, in the case of the high activities link, uh, activity links, a variety of densities and, and land uses, and then in the regional links, these are more low-density residential areas or open spaces, uh, but they're, they both look like arterials. And then we have uh, neighborhood links and uh, residential links. So the th one piece that isn't listed here is um, highway, and that's still a function that would be maintained, uh, but we aren't necessarily obviously proposing major changes to highways since the city doesn't have a, a lot of control over that. Um, but also that these are not streets that, for example, need to incorporate uh, pedestrian travel or what have you, whereas all of these types, uh, we would like to see pedestrian activity and uh, multimodal uses incorporated. Next, please. So here is an example of what a cross-section looked like. This is just a draft. 
um, but we're again trying to figure out a way to incorporate um, clarity and flexibility, but still show what a, a street cross section might look like. This only showing one direction of travel, and we're working with staff to figure out, you know, what exactly would this look like, and what are the right dimensions and components to in incorporate. But one thing that we uh, have been discussing is the idea of a flex lane that changes depending on where you are in the land use um, or where you are in the city specifically, but you have your general purpose lane that can be one or, or two lanes depending on how much traffic the street needs to carry, but then that flex lane, if it's necessary, maybe that in some areas is a bike lane, in some areas it might be another travel lane, or it could be a bus lane, and, and that just depends on where we are in the city. And we're working again with staff to make sure that we have the right typologies sorted out for the whole network. Next, please. Um, so here we go to the network. Um, we have been looking at uh, connectivity, trying to understand the east-west capacity versus the north-south capacity versus the east-west demand and capacity, and, and also looking at the speed analysis and seeing is the issue that there isn't enough capacity east-west is, is what we're hearing, or is it really the speed of travel when you're going east-west and trying to understand what are the what is the, the heart of the problem so that we can get to uh, solutions that are going to be consistent with what the long-term vision for the city needs to be. Um, and then looking at safety analysis and focusing in on trends and, and causes of incidents, and then uh, also looking at uh, some of the bike ped connections um, and looking at uh, how we can stitch all those things together. The, um, the graphics that you're seeing on the right is looking at things like the signal density and trying to understand where it, traffic incidents are occurring and how we can capitalize on those things, as well as, the again, the existing capacity uh, in the, the network. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we've discovered is that, yes, there is higher capacity in northwest arterials than east-west, but most of or more than half of the commute trips are north-south trips. And so we're seeing you know, the, we're not quite seeing the same level of congestion that people are frustrated with in the east-west direction, but that doesn't mean that there aren't ways that we can improve the way that people uh, travel. And part of it is that the east-west trips, uh, because there may be fewer direct connections, uh, tend to be somewhat more circuitous, and so perhaps they're getting a little bit uh, more held up by some of the north-south congestion in addition to having uh, perhaps fewer options to get across. Um, one of the other things that we're focused on is what those primary barriers to east-west connectivity are. And uh, if you go to the next slide, looking at ways that we can make new roadway connections. And so we've analyzed a fair number of different connections, including the arterial loop, uh, looking at what the existing demand is for using different uh, aspects of the or different locations in the road network and running what's called a network uh, an analysis to understand if we introduce a new uh, connection in the network, a new roadway in the network, how would people react to that? And we literally looked at all of these different uh, new connections and tried to figure out what's the size or capacity of those connections and tried to understand how things would change. If you go to the next slide, I think there's an example of what that looks like. Mm, maybe the next one? No. Nope, sorry. Okay, so here, um, if we go one more, thank you. Um, here's just a, a summary of potential roadway connections. You can see um, where they're located throughout the city. Um, the arterial loop is a, a loop around the whole city, and so you can see that this is the one that provides uh, notable benefit in terms of commute trips, um, saving travel time. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only thing we're looking at. We are looking at other uh, things, but we're also giving some feedback on which of these um, have, again, the, the greatest benefits and what the pros and cons of all of them are in summarizing that. Next step. Wonderful. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is uh, how the speeds and volumes on the network uh, relate to the active transportation network, the, the transit network, um, and looking at recommended minimum lane widths of different uh, types of streets 
and incorporating that into the street typology that we're looking at. And again, in terms of speed versus the active network. Next, please. Uh, and here is arterials versus shared roadways and looking at how um, the different typologies match once we overlay the transit plan and the, the uh, active transportation network or active transportation plan and seeing where there might be opportunities or needs to Im make improvements there. Next, please. And then here, uh, based on all of that information, as well as lots of uh, additional analyses and discussions, um, we are going to drill down on a few corridors uh, around the city and wanted to share that information with you as well. Um, these are corridors that are not necessarily the full complement of all the priorities for the city, but uh, they are the corridors that we want to, that we are going to focus our efforts in terms of figuring out how, do, how would we apply the street typology um, cross sections, for example, to these corridors and what might the potential benefits be and looking also at some of the intersection improvements that can be made there and seeing how the network as a whole might be improved uh, by making some changes here. And again, this is um, one of the, the corridors that we have done some analysis and uh, sorry, one of the areas that we've done some analysis and discussion with staff. Next, please. So here's an example of how we might approach one of these corridors looking at um, college and looking at the, the typology. Um, this is a, a corridor that we might consider would be a, a high activity regional link. Um, it's currently a principal arterial in the um, plan. And then um, looking at the land uses and, and how they all stitch together to, to create that and then looking at the problems that we're seeing um, and beginning to think through what are the potential opportunities. So um, what are the ways that we can change this and how does it connect to uh, the additional streets? Uh, for example, Archibald Yell and looking at how we might uh, address or affect some change that addresses the long-term goals. Of course, we also have to uh, be cognizant of the challenges there. So figuring out how we can manage uh, traffic but still keep it moving. Uh, through some of those changes. Next, please. Um, next, please. <laughs> next, please. Okay. So um, I think this is my last slide. So looking at um, where we're going next, um, we are planning outreach um, and returning to folks with a full complement of strategies. This is just a sort of a quick flavor for what we'll be sharing, but we'll uh, re return again in um, early summer, late spring, I think May was what we were discussing, um, to talk through all the different strategies uh, by mode to present the overall uh, network and how the street typologies change and reflect both the function of streets as well as the context of the land uses, and then prepare the final recommendations and the parking management plan, uh, pulling all of that together and uh, potentially looking at ways that we can make uh, some early action recommendations um, for the team to review. And all of that um, should be wrapped up in the summer. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, th thank you, Zabe. Um, but before um, I ask the committee members what questions they have, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of feedback would be best for you to receive tonight um, to help you as you complete the last third of your scope? So I would say anything that seems, well, a couple of things, anything that seems incredibly uh, good, something that you're really encouraged to see and would like to see more of, anything that seems off to you, whether it's uh, a finding on you know, the existing conditions analysis or issues with, the, um, with you know, some of the recommendations or anything that you think, hey, I, I wish you had talked about this other thing with, and you know, Chris or I might say, yes, we're actually looking at that. Um, or we might say, hmm, that's something to, to consider adding uh, moving forward. But so things that are great, things that don't seem so quite right and anything that you think is missing. Okay. 
So um, we'll start with the committee. We might have a few members of the public that would like to make some brief comments too. So we'll, we'll do that second and um, then we'll come back to the committee before we uh, adjourn on this item. So Alan, you'd like to go first? I do, I have a question on slide number 38, priority corridors. It's just generally a question on how these were ranked or are they ranked or is this just a list? It's just a list. They are absolutely not ranked at all. Okay, I was just curious, thank you. Yeah. So I had sure. a question on this slide as well, this is Matthew. Um, <coughs> I noticed that uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, uh, disconnected segments are proposed as priority corridors um, in, in a broader arterial. And so, so I'm wondering, I, I understand why there might be reasons to do that, but, but I'm wondering will we be able to take what we learn about these priority segments and, and the new typologies and, and later when we're ready uh, apply what we've learned to the, the gaps that, aren't indica that are not indicated here? Yeah, so the idea behind the segments as well as the corridors was to, to give an, uh, opportunities to apply the street typologies um, both in terms of the typologies so that each type is represented and also so that each um, modal priority is represented. So is this a street that might take you know, a good bit of transit? Is this a street that's in our, uh, you know, the bike network or something like that? Um, but the idea is that they are examples of ways to apply the changes, not necessarily the be all and end all. And so those changes could be carried forward beyond this. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we chose like two different segments of college so that you could see how that it changes in different segments as well as to choose different types of streets. Okay, Does that thank help? You. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay. Justin? Um, this is Justin Tennant. I don't know what, what uh, slide it is number wise, but you were talking about uh, parking and the different um, uh, ways uh, for to make things say more user friendly for example or um, what that one what I what I see more and more in the cities that I travel in is an ease of stress on behalf of people who had a, who used to think parking was terrible in certain cities because they have a lot more access to availability of parking whether this it's your you use this example of real-time availability also, I think um, many of the parking areas that I see downtown, I was just in San Francisco and almost all the downtown parking lots now have space available indicators like you talk about whether you enter a facility, some of them have apps and all of those sort of things. So I think one of the things I hear more than anything with people from East Fayetteville, for example, that go downtown is that they, they don't like the, the user experience on the parking and, and there's, there's apps that you can use, there's ways you can do it, but I think making it easier to, uh, to let people know space availability. I think the university could also benefit from that because in many cases, university parking lots are uh, not used at their capacity except maybe a couple of times a day, but I think the perception is that it's a lot worse than it really is. So if we could ease that perception somehow in the city by by these sort of things, I, I think that would greatly improve uh, the people's thought of our of our parking part of our transportation. So I really appreciate this, and I hope that there's some more uh, detail put in it, maybe of, of things we can offer people for uh, availability of, of parking, in, whether it's in real time or at the facilities themselves that we have, or something like that. So I really like that. Great, thanks for that feedback. Odella. Okay, um, th this is Matthew again. So um, I, I wanted to highlight two things. Um, one that I liked and one that gives me a little bit of concern. The, the first is uh, the, the examples that you had from the Boston plan of the cross sections for each typology, I, I thought was a really good way to, to communicate those um, to the public, uh, whether it's the general public or, or future developers. Um, I, I think it's clear right now that the way we communicate it uh, is, is a little bit confusing um, and, and the Boston of all the examples you showed look, look, to, look to me to be the clearest way uh, of, of communicating that type of information. So I like that a lot. Um, the one thing that gave me a little bit of pause wasn't in your presentation, but it was in your, um, your technical memo, the, the draft for walking and biking. And um, you, you did uh, an analysis of walking itineraries and uh, how, how built up or how complete the network was 
and um, you, you measured completeness by uh, roadways at, uh, having sidewalks on at least one side of the street. And um, I, I understand why we might do that, but I also want to, want to exercise some, some caution there and, and may, maybe bring in uh, some judgment calls to that. There are certainly areas in the city where, we've, where one side of the street for a sidewalk is sufficient, but I think there are, there are other areas where it's, it's not sufficient and, and where crossing the street um, may mean a, a, even a five minute wait um, for a pedestrian or, or longer if they have to cross back to the other side. And uh, you know, I, I think that's real significant when we talk about um, the, the, the way we define um, pedestrian sheds. And, and, and similarly with, with crosswalks, um, if our measurement of completeness is that somebody can, can use two or three crosswalks to get around an intersection because the one that they really needed was, was missing, um, I, I think we should be cautious about counting that uh, instances like that as, uh, as sufficient. Right, and, and I should mention that um, one of the metrics that we're using is looking at the existing network and the, you know, the, the proposed or future network and making sure that indicators like that are trending in the right direction. But we're also focusing on how to close gaps and how the, the network and the typologies can help to do that. And so we're going, we have a couple of examples going where we drill down on a particular area or, you know, by a school, for example, and try to figure out how can we make this feel more complete so that we are not going to be able to give you, you know, every single thing because we're doing a citywide master plan, but we'll give you examples of how you can close gaps and sort of fill in where there needs to be an additional connections and, and locations like that, whether it's sidewalk or crosswalk. Um, but yes, we agree that, that there are definitely times when having a sidewalk on one side of the street absolutely is not sufficient. And we'll, we'll point those out as well. That's great. Um, and I add one other thing. So on the commuter flows, um, th do I understand right that you develop those, those, um, th that analysis using uh, census data about job and housing locations? Yes. Okay. So. Um, uh, I, I love that data set, but um, I also wonder, is there a way for us to include uh, uh, transportation flows relative to school drop-offs and, and pickups? Because I suspect that um, quite a bit of our peak hour congestion is, is due to that uh, above and beyond uh, uh, workplace flows. So we do have a, a separate um, school-based transportation analysis and, and we can certainly talk more about it offline but we're trying to figure out ways that we can address the need for school drop-off and how that contributes to congestion as well as how that contributes to you know basically forcing people to drive rather than creating options for walking or biking to school okay so agreed anything else from the committee okay would any members of the public like to give feedback or ask a question Yes, come forward. Hey, I'm Drew Wallace, and I'm on the Active Transportation Advisory Committee, and I just happen to be here uh, for some other stuff, and I'm really glad I was. I want to say that this is fantastic, and you've worked really hard for this, and I can tell, and this is, uh, I just want to say that uh, it's great that you've worked so hard, and this is really exciting. Um, and one thing that really jumped out to me where you said that 40% um, of people in Fayetteville live within three miles of work and need like improved access to that. And I was just curious how you got um, kind of those statistics. Did that come from the mobility plan like survey, or did that come from a separate survey, or how exactly was that um, kind of figured out? Because I think that would be a huge way to improve our like uh, mobility plan is to, to uh, advertise that 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 would be a way that you could get to work besides just driving. So thank you. Great, uh, appreciate that feedback. Um, the data comes from the same census set looking at commute trips and then um, looking at a combination of how people actually do make their commute trips versus looking at the network and examining what are called desire lines and looking at how people could or what their existing commute trip is their trip distance versus their trip mode basically is how we analyze that i hope that answered your question yeah, anyone else okay um we'll come back to the committee um 
that probably concludes it, but I want to give more, one more opportunity for any committee members to make a comment and ask a question. Okay, Zabe, do you feel like you got what you needed from, from this, or should we address something else? Uh, this is good for me, um, and if there are any additional questions, I'm assuming that uh, Chris uh, Brown can field those questions or comments moving forward. I don't know, Chris, if you had any additional follow-up that you wanted to make. I know you wanted to close out. Um, I don't think so. I, I will. Um, I can make this slideshow available to anybody who wants to look at it in further detail, and if you do have uh, questions, something you think about later on, just send it to me, and I'll certainly forward it to Zave as we move forward. Great. Okay. Thank you for phoning in, Zabe. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate your feedback.